Hey everyone, welcome to another lecture in AP Environmental Science. Today we're going to do a very quick overview of geology. And the importance of this lecture is, what we're leading into is our resource consumption and how we get resources. And in this case, you can see from the table 25.1, almost all of our global reserves, U.S. reserves, all, everything we use needs to be mined. And so this brief lecture is just going to sh kind of give you an overview of how we how these things got there. So... Almost all the mineral resources on Earth accumulated when the planet formed about 4.6 billion years ago, which we're going to briefly discuss. And the Earth's geologic processes form and break down rocks, minerals. They drive volcanic eruptions, cause earthquakes. And this is going to determine the distribution of scarce mineral, mineral resources and create the soil in which plants grow. So in this module, we're going to examine the distribution of Earth's mineral resources and some of the geologic processes that continue to affect the distribution. So our objectives here, we're going to look at, again, the distribution of elements on Earth, how they got there and how they formed. We're going to look at the theory of plate tectonics and how it's relevant in the study of the environment. And finally, we're going to end with the description of the rock cycle and how it's important in environmental science. So moving forward, we have this, there's 92 elements that are available to us from Earth. And the availability of these resources occurred when the planet formed again 4.6 billion years ago. And the theory we use for this is, or the hypothesis is the nebular hypothesis. And a brief version of this hypothesis is that a little over 4.6 billion years ago, we were this dense cloud just kind of floating in space. It's believed there was some large explosion, maybe a supernova nearby that caused this dense cloud of gas to condense on itself, creating the spinning. As a result, we have our solar system where we are today, the creation of not only the Earth, but the sun, the planets, and all the other um, elements and planets and stars and meteors in our, I shouldn't say stars, not stars, but our single star and all the other asteroids and things like that in our solar system. So the nebular hypothesis occurred creating our solar system, but also allowed us the access to these elements on our planet. So we're going to start looking at the Earth's layers. We're going to start from the inside, working our way out. We have our core in the middle. And it's important to notice, note that the core is made up of mostly iron and nickel. And do not make sure you understand that. The inner core is solid, whereas the outer core is liquid. The solid is just due to the intense pressure. So you have this solid inner core. You have a liquid outer core. And above the outer core, you have this mantle. And that's where most of our magma is the this magma this liquid rock and right at the top of the mantle we have what we call this asthenosphere it's the it's still part of the mantle but what's important is that it's semi-molten it behaves almost like heated plastic or you might hear the word ductile that it can bend it can move so that's what that asthenosphere is it's warm enough it's not melted but it's able to bend and again this is solid rock that's bending. And finally, we have our lithosphere. Our lithosphere, you can see up here, is that solid upper mantle and our thin, thin crust. So there's our layers working from the inside out. And to give you kind of an idea of how large this is, if we were to take the entire North America from west coast to east coast, that's about how um, the depth that our earth, the uh, layers go. And building on that plate tectonics and the layers of the earth, we know that there's magma in this mantle, and a lot of it has to do with, we know from hot spots, which we'll look at a lot more in detail in class. But what's important to note here is that deep in the mantle, you have what we call a plume, or imagine like when there's a fire, there's a plume of smoke going up from the fire. So there's this magma that's just rising deep from inside the mantle, breaking through the lithosphere, and then through the crust, in creating these islands, and Hawaii is a perfect example. The Hawaiian Islands, the Galapagos Islands, there's even a hot spot beneath North America where uh, Yellowstone is. So it's important to note that the hot spot stays in the same spot. The hot spot is not moving, it's the plate that's moving. And again, we'll get more into detail again, hot spots uh, during class. And here you can see a bat bathmetric map. Um, and it goes to show you, yes, the green parts are the areas of Hawaii that are above um, sea level, but you can see that this hot spot, this magma has been overflowing lava. And um, as a result, as the 
islands move away. Notice if you were to travel to Hawaii and want to see an active volcano, the only island you would go to is Kona, the large island, That's because that's where the hot spot is. So before we get into plate tectonics, we do have to do a little bit of history. We're going to talk about briefly Alfred Wegener in the early 1900s. He kind of looked at the map of the United States, or I'm sorry, map of the world. Notice that the continents look like they fit together like a puzzle. Did some research, and you know, it came up with this idea of continental drift. And with continental drift, what he said is that there was one about 200, 225 million years ago. There was one major continent, and since then, the continents have been moving apart. Unfortunately, Alfred Wegener passed away and his um, theory was never accepted in the scientific community. And it wasn't until the mid 70s where we kind of developed plate tectonics and we realized that, you know what, Alfred Wegener did have something going on. He knew what he was talking about. So today with plate tectonics, lithosphere, we say it's divided into plates. Almost imagine a hard boiled egg that's cracked. The shell's still on, but there's cracks and th things of that nature. The crust of the earth is very similar. You can see it's broken apart into these major plates. And looking at the arrows, most of them are in motion. And we're going to see later on that this motion is going to cause certain uh, uh, geologic events to happen. So the problem with Wegener is he had the idea, but he didn't. He could not explain how the plates move. So again, it wasn't until plate tectonics theory we figured out that it was this convection currents, these Almost like the, um, imagine a, at the grocery store, the belt that you put your groceries on to take it to the the um, person that's scanning them, that the plate, the, the food, whatever you're buying, moves across that conveyor belt. Same idea with the plates. The plates are sitting on top of the, the mantle, and we all know that when things are very, very warm, it could be air, it could be water, and in this case, it's magma as the hot magma rises and we know the temperature is going to decrease and as we know when things get colder they get more dense and they want to sink so again it's like these plates are moving on these conveyor belts and as a result there's going to be interactions when you have collisions or you're going to even have plates separating which leads us into our three types of plate interactions first one is a divergent plate and it's self-explanatory so when things diverge they separate so what's happening here is two plates are moving away from each other, and as a result, you can see that magma is rising up to the surface. And as magma rises up to the surface, new ocean crust is formed. So we call this seafloor spreading, and a perfect example is at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So if we look at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, again, you can see that it literally is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's separating the um, the Part of the North America is moving to the left, whereas uh, Eurasia, Africa is moving to the right, and it's moving further apart. And there's only one spot on Earth where it's at the surface. All this is below the Atlantic Ocean. But if you were to go to Iceland, you could literally see that the North American side is here, the Eurasian side is here, and they're moving apart. So the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, or I should say the Atlantic Ocean, is getting larger. Then you have convergent plate boundaries, where two plates are going to collide. And the interesting thing about this is certain things happen depending on which two um, plates are colliding. It could be oceanic, continental, and you can see oceanic plates sinking beneath the continent, causing um, volcanoes on the continent side. This is occurring in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington. Um, you could have oceanic, oceanic, where one oceanic crust is sinking beneath the other. This is happening off the coast of, the, of Alaska, the Aleutian Islands. Or you could have two continental plates colliding. Notice that when you have two continental plates colliding, neither one is really sinking. So as a result, you have these massive mountains. You have very tall mountains, no volcanoes. Volcanoes are only associated with oceanic plates. But this is where we have Mount Everest and the Himalayas being created. So these are convergent. And the last one is what we have is transform. So we don't have any colliding. We don't have any separating. What we have is they're sliding past each other. And California, the San Andreas Fault is a perfect example. You have, again, notice there's no volcanic activity. But as we all know, in California, you have a high occurrence of earthquakes. So that's transform. So make sure you understand the three types of plate boundaries. And there's going to be consequences, as we mentioned earlier. Just previously, there's going to be earthquakes, and you're also going to get volcanoes. And again, this is all due to oceanic crust being much heavier 
it sinks. As it sinks into the mantle, the heat and pressure increases, causing magma to form, and as a result, volcanoes will form. And again, just briefly, the hot spots. We talked about the Hawaiian Islands as another example of magma coming to the surface. Finally, a fault is just a movement in Earth's crust. You can see the grayish rocks. They used to obviously be aligned. All right, we have our fault here going down the center. So a fault is just this break and a movement in the Earth's crust. And faults are usually the result of earthquakes. That sudden break of the fault is going to release a lot of energy. And you can see, if we looking at the map, most um, earthquakes, the grayish here, occur where two plates are interacting. They're either colliding or they're sliding past each other. Um, and even at divergence zones, you're going to have these earthquakes. Where if you have these plates moving apart, you're having earthquakes or seismic activity. We're going to end this lecture on the rock cycle. Very, very brief. It's just important that you know that there are three types of rocks. and they form in three different ways. So the first ones are igneous. And the key thing with igneous is these are formed from molten rock. If it's on the inside of the earth, we call that magma. Molten rock on the inside of the earth is magma. If it cools and it hardens, we say it's intrusive. If it is expelled on the surface, either through a volcano or through a fissure, we say that is extrusive. And that is just magma cooling, or actually, I'm sorry, that is lava that's cooling on the surface of the earth. Moving on to our sedimentary rocks. It's, it's very self-explanatory. Whenever you have this sediment, it could be mud, sand, gravel, tiny, tiny sediment to large um, pieces of sediment. When they get compacted and cemented together, we call those sedimentary rocks. It's also important to know that fossils... We only find fossils in sedimentary rocks, which makes sense because with the igneous rocks, if it's warm enough to melt rock, any sort of life left behind, like bones, is going to be melted as well. And moving on to metamorphic rocks, which involve a lot of heat and a lot of pressure, fossils usually don't survive that as well. Important to know with metamorphic rocks is there is a lot of heat, there is a lot of pressure, but there is no melting involved because melting would result in igneous rocks. So there's your three types of rocks. There's your very brief um, introduction to geology, which will get us going to this next unit. As always, if you have any questions, come see me, email me, or check the website.